Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you so much for all coming along here. I now feel slightly overwhelmed um, by how many people think that this is going to be a slick and polished demo that <laughs> totally hasn't just been written in the spare time I've had during the day because I forgot that maybe if I was demoing something I might actually have to demo it. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, so I'm going to be talking about this piece of software and work that we've been doing called the Software Assessment Framework. And basically, uh, this has come about for two reasons. One is uh, that we're interested in understanding how to uh, measure software. And in this case, I've just been in the software metrics blog post and discussion section. Here, we're really talking about measuring aspects of the software or the producers of software themselves, rather than uh, understanding how you might do kind of credit for software or something like that. Um, and the other is because uh, EPSRC gave us money to do this because they would really like to know which software they should stop funding. Um, <laughs> they didn't quite put it like that, but that's effectively what funders are also interested in. So, you know, how do they decide where to put limited resources um, into pieces of software? So how do you make that choice between a piece of software which has hundreds of users um, but might be really shoddy uh, kind of quality versus something that has tens of users uh, but was really well made? That's actually a really difficult question. Um, and as I said in my lightning talk, the problem is that we are talking about what is good software and how can we measure how good it is, but really we can't do that unless we have hindsight. So um, here are the kind of reasons we care. Um, as a researcher, what we're interested in is making it easier to choose between software. Um, as a software developer, we're kind of trying to increase recognition of good practice. Um, from the industry's perspective, one of the things we hear a lot is that people can't use research software in industry because they don't think it's of uh, good enough quality to pick up, particularly if you're a small or medium-sized enterprise where you don't have the resources of a Microsoft to kind of go in and redo everything. So. Um, all of these are kind of very good reasons why we should care, and the question is, how can we help this? Um, so I think I've said this one already, yeah. Uh, good, is, good is determined by the user based on their future needs, so you need hindsight. So um, we've been trying to understand how to create good proxy criteria for this that might be measurable. Um, and the obvious thing to do in this case is look at what's being done for data, uh, because data has had a 10 to 20 year head start on us. Um, so some things that you can look at are things like the data seal of approval, um, the Open Data Institute in, uh, certificates, and you can see different frameworks that they have created for assessing and certifying uh, research data production and mostly publication. Uh, so there's lots of guidelines out here and you can kind of see it. The interesting thing here is it sort of splits into two sorts of things. Um, things like the data seal of approval, are really about assessing the producers of the data, or indeed the places where the data are stored. And on the other side, um, Open Data Institute certificates are really about assessing the data set itself. So you have this natural split coming um, around producers versus products. And for software, the big question is, which is the right one to assess? Um, you know, we could we could do a software seal of approval for a producer, and we could get a software assessment certificate for a product. Um, and here's where it starts to break down a little bit, because we can't quite reuse um, exactly all the stuff that's been done on the research data side, because the concept of publishers changes substantially between research data and software. Um, most software, um, and I say this in quotes because it is um, me kind of invoking the anecdotal evidence, uh, most software is not published through a repository. Uh, the majority of research software is published on web pages. Um, if it is published in a repository, that repository is GitHub. Um, and if you want to w work, uh, find out how we know that, ask Simon, who's been trawling through everyone's research fish entries to find out where software actually is stored. Um, and the problem with this is that these are not really repositories that we control in any way or sense. And we cannot really say that software has been published through them in the same sense that research data is. So the comparison starts to break down. But you know, we could, we could start still do that and look at both software producers and software products and understand what it is we might want to start measuring. Um, I'm going to skip that a little bit, though. 
because I want to get onto the actual demoing bit. Um, so there's a lot of related work. Um, one of the things that came up in our discussion group is there's a lot of existing um, practice here. Uh, in software engineering, there's a lot on software quality. Uh, in research software, there's an increasingly large set of di uh, guidelines. And now I realize this was the place where I needed to find the links that I was trying to put in our blog post. Um, so each, uh, each community is starting to come up with their own guidelines for what they think um, uh, software quality means. So for instance, ESIT uh, have produced some guidelines for earth sciences. Claria have done some uh, guidelines for um, the digital humanities. Um, ASCL have started kind of doing some work for astronomy. So there's all these kind of guidelines that are going on. And also there's a lot more tools. So things like Depsy and libraries.io. Who's heard of Depsy? Okay, who's heard of libraries.io? Same group. Um, if you've not heard of these, these are, these are um, a part of a set of tools um, that allow you to understand better the impact of certain pieces of software. So Depsy goes and kind of cross-references mentions of Python and R software in papers to understand their importance. Uh, and libraries.io looks to see what libraries are being used by other libraries and applications. So you've got an understanding of the dependencies there. Um, so there's all these kind of things that are going on. So there's a lot of related work, but there's still relatively little tooling. Um, and part of the reason for that is it's actually quite hard. So um, the thing that we've noticed is that when you start trying to look at some of the measures that people propose, many measures are subjective. So the most commonly um, recommended one is it has documentation that works for me. Um, that's subjective on so many different levels. Um, so the question becomes, how do you try and make them more objective measures? Second one is that many me uh, metrics are costly to measure. Um, so some of them are, can be done quite easily using automation, but many of them require time, effort, or money to really uh, to, to do properly. Uh, and one of the things that kind of alarms me the most, several of the well-established um, software metrics coming from um, software engineering may not be accurate, uh, particularly for the software that we're talking about. So there is a increasing body of work that says some of the software metrics that are out there and in common usage, some of the things you may have heard about, like the kind of like code complexity, um, don't work anymore given that we no longer have the kind of monolithic code bases that we, uh, we had in the 60s and 70s. So. Um, all of these things make it hard to create tooling. The other thing is it's unclear what we're doing this for. So are we doing this to help people improve their software? Are we helping it, uh, doing it to help people compare the software? Or is it to do some sort of accreditation quality? So all sorts of questions that we're trying to answer with these sort of things. So we did a pilot exercise to look at this, um, trying to find out why people think software is good. That's really hard to do as well, because just now there is no um, there is no set of data that says these things are scientific software or research software and these particular ones people think are good or bad. So that's one thing that I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing from people. Um, and the sort of things that came back are much as you would expect. So the sorts of things that people are looking at are around documentation, number of users, um, signs of activity, the quality of the documentations, um, things like related publications and citations, which is very important for research in a way that uh, is not at all important for most types of software, and things like case studies and examples of real life use. There's a large part of this which is all about the time dimension. So one of the things we've been conscious of is things change with software development through time. How do we have an assessment framework that will allow us to create metrics that have that time dimension? Um, and in many cases, usage might be the most important feature, but how do you measure usage effectively? Um, and obviously there's this problem about hidden software. We're not going to deal with that. If the software can't be found, that's another problem and not one that can be solved by this sort of thing. So what we'd like to try and do is create a badging system that rewards practice. Um, we'd like it to be really easy to get the lower levels of badges so everyone can have that little pat on the back and say, you're doing the right thing, and make it progressively harder to get to the very high level of badges. So many um, kind of um, uh, systems have this idea of kind of like 
bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and so on. And maybe we could do something like that. And this was one of our first attempts to try and look at some of the categories. Um, the other thing we wanted to understand is when we should assess uh, software. So uh, there are different times we could assess software. We could assess it when, uh, when kind of like a major release has been published. So that's assessment based on the software producer deciding to submit it, um, or indeed on uh, at the point where software is used in a major publication. Again, that's kind of like something where the choice is on the producer of the software. You could look at it on the other side. Um, you, could, you could argue that we need to do this like a food hygiene certificate where all software producers, all research groups are assessed on a regular basis and they need to go in for assessment again um, at periodic intervals or indeed on just applying for a grant. So you, know, you, you can't submit a grant until you've had this little tick that says you follow the basic good practices for producing software. And then there's a the question of whether this is self-assessment, peer assessment, or through some sort of official accreditation authority. Um, from my perspective, that last one is a bad idea. So we'll see. Um, and then uh, the last thing on, on the kind of like background on this is uh, understanding the kind of attitudes to this. Because we've got to be careful here. I mentioned at the start that one of the reasons why people are interested in doing this is because uh, people want to make decisions, hard decisions about where funding might go. And one of the things we don't want to do is discourage people from getting their software assessed or indeed from just producing software. Um, so how can, we, how can we kind of understand the attitudes that will ensure that people uh, use this for their own benefit, not just because someone else says they have to? Um, and that's kind of tricky. So anyway, that's the kind of background. Any questions? No? OK. Uh, so, so here's what we tried to do. Um, and this is obviously is the user interface that I'm going to show you later. No. Um, th so these are, these are mock-ups using Balsamic. Um, what we would like to try and do is create a framework that makes it easy to assess a piece of software. So we're going to look at the problem of assessing a piece of software directly rather than assessing the producers of software, which we also think we need to do but we suggest we probably do that through a different process. Um, we'd like to have a framework which allows us to uh, define a number of individual metrics which are all very objective uh, and can be measured uh, in a specific way, group them into categories, and then take those categories to give levels. So in this case, kind of like badges. So I'm actually going to show you a slightly different version of this in the real demo. Um, so we might consider like four different categories around, say, availability, usability, maintainability, and portability, and then have different criteria for each of these. And the thing that we really want to be able to do is um, make it possible for um, different communities to create different kinds of templates based on these metrics that represent what they care about. So this idea of being able to switch different metrics on and off and assign importances to them. So that um, you might think, for instance, that um, usability is really important, and I might think that uh, actually I'll trade off usability for performance. So all these different kind of things could be done through this sort of framework by having a, uh, a kind of like um, a decoupling of the way that metrics are calculated and the way that an overall score is applied to a piece of software. Um, what we hope will happen is that we're able to kind of put together some basic templates for people, and then people can, yeah, can, can kind of go on and change them. Dan? Yeah, I was just going to ask, do you consider this to be time invariant? No. So, so if by time invariant you mean uh, do it once and then it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like the same for all time, or...? Would you, would you expect that the software system would change over time without the software changing? Um, yes, we would. Um, so so uh, when we, do, we had a workshop um, three weeks ago, I think, at which I'm trying to see if anyone in this room was at that workshop. No, like lots of people who were from the same organizations as people in this room were at this workshop, but none of you were actually at that workshop. Um, uh, one of the big things that came up was this idea that effectively assessments and certifications and accreditations, they all decay. Um, so there is a natural decay and the question is really how fast and how, how we deal with that. 
Um, so the, the probable thing is to understand how long it takes for something to decay before it becomes meaningless. Um, so yeah, no, we do expect that to change. Um, what we'd hope is that uh, effectively developers would submit software to allow us to capture the metadata and to have uh, a regularly up-to-date um, set of measures for that, which then people can, can kind of judge and compare software, perhaps not necessarily against each other, but against previous versions, perhaps. So, so yeah, so the idea is to try and, um, is to try and kind of like decouple the, the way that a score is created from the definition of the metrics themselves. And that might be for very good reasons. Um, so one example that came up um, in, in recent discussion is, for instance, I could, have a, I could have a metric which is something like bus factor. So a bus factor, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, is basically uh, an, it's, it's a measure of how resilient your code is to your developers being run over by buses. So uh, if if you have a bus factor of one, it means that there's only one developer who's working and understands that particular piece of code. Now, I could create a, uh, I could create a measure um, uh, that is bus factor that is implemented by saying you're just looking at the total number of contributors across the entire code base. So um, I'm just going to do a very simple count and say if you have one contributor, your bus factor is one. If you have two contributors, um, your bus factor is two which is a bit naive, but might be a good proxy. I don't know. Um, someone else might say, well, actually, no, you want to go into more detail. And it's actually around how the uh, code is split at a file level. So you can go in and create a bus factor metric that is um, doing exactly the same thing, coming up with similar sort of uh, indicative scorings that are used in the templates, but based around how many contributors there are for a particular file. Another person might create a different version of my abstract bus metric and do it based on a function. So, so our intention is to kind of come up with um, a framework that allows all of these to coexist and for people to kind of put in their own. And uh, I'll come to uh, and one thing that uh, we're keen to do is for all of these metrics to be open because one of the things that we're aware of is if you have closed effectively benchmarking metrics, you can get into the Volkswagen situation. So we're hoping that by doing this and allowing people to contribute to something which can be openly inspected, we can get to a point where we do self-assessment, but we have the option of a peer reviewing it and going, hmm, I don't think you've done that uh, entirely right. So, James. Um, is it your intention that every metric should be something which is a can be run as computer code, right? An automatic assessment, because I think I need a human to do a bus number measurement. Yeah. So no. So um, we we effectively have two different types of um, basic abstract metrics. One is uh, one is one which looks at the properties of the code base in a version control system, and the other one is one which asks a uh, a user to or, or a developer to answer a specific set of questions. So we have this idea of the two different ones and um, in your case you're creating a bus factor metric that falls into the second category. Um, one of the things that we're still uh, struggling with and we'd love some input or indeed contributions on is how best to kind of fit these two different metrics together in the collection because obviously whilst we can run um, the first category every time someone um, tries to refresh the page on a piece of software, the second one only works if people fill that out again. So we're not quite sure and, and you'll be able to see some really, really um, tied together with uh, string and sellotape uh, stuff in the actual thing. Uh, so yeah, so this is all being written in Python. Um, it's using a web app called Flask. We're wanting to have some command line functionality as well in the future because one of the things we would like to do is as people are putting in metrics, we'd like to do the opposite. Um, we'd like to run people's uh, metrics across the entire GitHub code base and see if there is any correlations we can see or clustering that we can okay. see. Um, we think that might be fun if nothing else. Um, and the other reason is because we really don't know what, where to set the indicative levels. Um, uh, it's, do, it's done using a plugin framework called Yapsi, so in theory, this makes it easy for people to, to um, extend. 
I think it's quite great because uh, recently I don't do very much software coding because really I'm a manager now, not a developer. But I have recently got into the habit of if a meeting that I'm in is really boring, dropping in and trying to code a metric. So if I can do that, probably everyone else in the room can do that. Um, and we're looking to get handlers for GitHub and Bitbucket repositories to start with. So we have a handler for GitHub. Uh, we have half a handler for Bitbucket, and uh, we probably will come up with one that allows you to do private file, um, uh, kind of privately hosted repositories as well. So, yeah, go ahead. If I had the SAP robot as a collaborator on my closed source repository, can it software assess my closed source software? Um, if, you, uh, if, if, if you basically did a login using uh, your OAuth GitHub credentials, then yes. So, functionality to be completed at <laughs> soon. So, um, so you can do this manually just now. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so, so if you if you're if you're happy to kind of put, uh, generate a new token, pop that into um, pop that into a config file and then run it. I think it should work. I haven't tested that properly, but uh, we're looking to do something using OAuth um, instead. So, uh, if you want to see all the stuff, it's at this point here. It's BSD licensed. So uh, that's the kind of that's the kind of like uh, please help us contribute. There are different things that we'd like to um, do, but maybe maybe at this point I will show you where we are with this, and then I'll come back to the what we're interested in, in understanding from you. Now, can everyone see this? Okay. So this is the this is the repository itself. Um, if you're interested in trying this out, uh, head to this repository, go to install um, md, uh, and please check out our installation instructions. And I hope that it all works for you. If not, find an issue. Um, uh, if you're interested in kind of understanding. Um, uh, sorry, if, if you're interested in contributing or have ideas for new metrics, please do kind of put um, them in as issues, because uh, I think one of the things we're trying to do is understand what people would like to see measured, even if they're not contributing those metrics themselves. <coughs> okay, so this is the bit that gets funny. So I'm going to tell you why this is funny after I've asked for some audience participation. Oh, no. That's, that's spinning. Spinning. Why, why is it just like dragging a window <laughs> in a live demo is a guarantee of failure? <laughs> it's Apple trying to protect you. <laughs> Apple are trying to protect you. They are, they are. They're kind of going like, <laughs> you don't want to do a live demo. Why would you ever want to do a live demo? Yes. That's a good question. Who do you think those individuals should be? Well, I think the temptation is that they're probably going to be more the kind of software experts when in reality, it, you know, you, you possibly want to ask complete novices how, how well they got on with the software because they're the ones that are going to be, you know, running into problems if it, you know, the idea of good documentation is subjective. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think where where we see this working is probably that a particular community nominates some people who who have some sort of standing within that community to kind of go like, all right, we all do start doing the assessment um, of of these pieces of software. But that's only one way potentially of of looking at it. Um, you might find that in other communities, people are perfectly happy for anyone to put in an assessment um, as long as uh, they're named, for instance. So you can kind of go back and go like, why did you assess it like that? Um, so, okay, let's see if this works now. So what are the kind of metrics that we started coding for? Um, so, so here's some examples of the kinds of things. I don't know if you can, can people see this at the back? No. no okay, right. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. 
So there are some things that we can do automatically. So let's take usability as a category. So there's some things that we can do automatically. We can, we can look and see if there's a readme file um, in, in a repository. That's quite a simple thing to look at. Um, and we can look to see whether there's a contribution policy. Um, again, relatively easy to do. And then the, here's the one of, um, that kind of fits your cat kind of category. So end user documentation. Uh, that's something where really we want some person reviewing that because we could kind of do end user documentation. There's, there's absolutely no one, nothing stopping one of you going there into the code base and putting in a metric for end user documentation that simply looks at the number of lines. You know, why not? Um, is it a useful one? Probably not for most communities. So here's one that, that you would see as being separate. Now, here's a good question. I've never tried clicking on these links before. <laughs> this, is, this is stuff that uh, John, one of the developers, put in um, on Friday. So I've got an idea. Oh, that's what it is. Ah, OK. Um, so yeah, so read me. Um, so each metric has kind of like a little bit of metadata behind it. Um, so in this case, you know, test for the existence of the file read me, um, what category it's in. Uh, so that one there, self-assessment, yes or no. So in this case, it's an automatically assessed one rather than a self-assessment one. Um, is it also possible to have metrics which combine, so like on the documentation, I could imagine a code which like tries to find the documentation and then if it, if it doesn't, it told it us human. So we think that the way we do this is through combinations of the two types of metrics. So doing that at more at the scoring level, um, simply because uh, whilst that seems like kind of a nice idea of doing it, um, the problem you get there is what happens if a person is not available. So it's kind of like I, I, we want to split the, the things that would run effectively at a regular um, schedule versus the things which require human intervention. So instead we'd look at it and do it like this. So um, you could, might split it into an automatic one that says, can we find documentation? Um, and then a, uh, a kind of like what we'd call a guided assessment one which says, how good is that documentation? So splitting that out. Um, if you can come up with a good way of doing that in combination, we're all ears. Um, but we suspect that those two things have to be split just for practical purposes. Yeah? The, the, the automated search for a, a readme file, yeah. what happens in the, in the case where, where my project doesn't have a readme file for some perfectly brilliant reason that we can't see now. But what happens then? Like I have a file written in another language or, or something. I, now. Yeah. So I guess there are two there are two answers to that. So the first case is uh, the one where actually the way we've implemented the metric is wrong, but the metric itself is fine. So that's the case of, for instance, um, we're scanning a foreign repository and the README file uh, is still a README file, but the way we're looking for it is is uh, being incredibly privileged and only considering the English language. So that's a case of we need, to, we need to fix what is essentially a bug in yeah. the implementation. Um, so the other one is more interesting. So the other one is basically, do you consider that metric to be a good metric? And that one, we're kind of leaving open to the community. So we're kind of going, uh, if you think this is a good metric, use it. If you don't think this is a good metric, don't use it. So, so we're kind of trying to split those two problems apart. But if if I wanted to use the metric, yeah. and I gave a low score in a particular thing because you can't find a readme yeah. example I'm using, would there be a way that I email someone or say, listen, I understand that your data process is I don't have a readme and that's bad, but blah, 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 my software is brilliant, it's making school better. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a really interesting question because uh, I think in part that depends on whether or not we decide to run a kind of uh, a central mothership instance right. or not. If that's the case, then yes, um, potentially there, there, w there would have to be that kind of mechanism. If, if the way that this is being done is everyone is running it as part of their own communities, then yes, again, there needs to be that case, but it would be different depending on the communities. The last thing, yeah. I suppose it's open source, right? So yeah. theoretically I could run it on my own thing. I 
Change it myself and, yeah. and modify it. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> My software rated A plus plus. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, then you'd have to publish that, and people would kind of go like, uh, if they see a metric that says. If, uh, if author I equals Vince Knight, say thumbs up, extremely good. We are incoming, we'll give you a second. <laughs> uh, so, so, so kind of, this is a digression, but one of the things we were looking at is the potential for uh, really silly metrics as well to kind of get us a bit of publicity. So some of the silly metrics include, uh, the, there's one that I've seen someone else use, which is the Dave factor. How many of your contributors are called Dave? But yeah, anyway. So I was thinking that some of these um, tests are quite heavyweight, so you actually get someone to read the documentation and see if it's um, good, yeah. which you might only want to do on a release. Yep. And some things are something you might want to keep track of yep. quite carefully, like code quality. So the me a mechanism to have different cadences for these things yeah. would be really nice. Yeah, so I, uh, the thing that we've not yet, uh, well, there's a lot of things we've not yet done. Uh, but one of the things that we do definitely need to do is understand how we can uh, make it easy for people to set appropriate cadences. So at present, we think that the default will be uh, will be that things like the things that are automatically assessed will be assessed as fast as we have uh, capacity, bandwidth, and um, <laughs> the good grace of GitHub to allow us to do. Um, whereas uh, for things which are um, kind of like uh, assessed by a person, it will become more like on a major release uh, because I think that's probably the appropriate length of time. But we might have it differently. So, okay. So there's, uh, there is an ex there are some examples of this. And some, there's some others we can do. So some of the, the other fun ones are, uh, this is, these two are the ones that, that you probably want to, to look at later. So we coded up some things that are time-based. Um, so uh, we can look at how things vary through time. Yeah, at the back. How do you evaluate the benefits of using these projects before you use Sorry, could you? How do you evaluate if, if this is a good thing for the users instead of not using the methods? So uh, by users here, you are meaning the people who choose to... Yes. Yeah. That is a really good question, um, and I think I think that kind of gets down to uh, the question of two questions. One is uh, actually are metrics useful for particular different use cases? So, is it useful to use particular uh, metrics, for instance, to aid your choice between two pieces of software, um, or to compare one version of a software with, uh, with an an older version of a piece of software? Um, and then the second thing there is, do, uh, do people, do users have enough trust in these numbers or these measures or these badges to actually believe what they're saying? Um, so the first one is, is an interesting one um, because I would say that intuitively we all use different types of measures, different kinds of indicators to do things like compare two pieces of software or to understand um, whether we think a new version is better or worse than the old version. Um, so if we think about the way that we might choose uh, a piece of software from um, an app store, um, there are many different ways. You might look at the review ratings, you might look at the individual reviews, you might just look at the what's changed and so on. So, so intuitively, people do use metrics. The question is, do we trust the metrics to give us the answers that we want? And the only way I think we can do that is by trying some of these out and working with communities to understand what they trust and what they don't trust. So one of the things that I haven't mentioned is um, we're now at the stage where we're going to start trying to pilot this with people as uh, once we have a, a wider set of um, measures to kind of measure things on. But yeah. yeah. Have, you, um, have you looked at uh, journals that do software peer review to see if the things that they ask their reviewers to do match the things that you've asked to look for here? Uh, we did do uh, something, I, 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 in, in part, I was trying to come back to this, and maybe you're exactly the right person for me to ask this question. I know I was sitting in a workshop where there was a split subgroup that looked at re uh, different journal policies review, um, review of software. Um, so we basically kind of like created a document that is sitting on Google Drive somewhere 
that looked at four or five journals, different policies for reviewing software. Um, and I can't find that document anymore. It wasn't me. Okay, it wasn't you. It was probably Reproducibility 2015 then. Um, that gives me, that's good then, because if it wasn't Wispy, I've got somewhere to do it. Yeah, yeah. It could have been a different Wispy group, but I wasn't there. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it, it's certainly something to do. I, again, what we're trying to do is make it easy for people to kind of put things in um, because we're aware that uh, with the best one in the world, um, we do not have enough effort to create every metric that people would want to see. All right, I'm going to try something now. Here's the live demo bit then because, you know, we want to do this. I think we've only, I think we're almost at time as well, aren't we? Uh, over time. Damn it. Okay, so. Uh, here's, here's the thing for you then. Um, uh, so, does someone want to put in a piece of software from GitHub? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Who? Uh, the actual project? Are you looking for you give the URL? Or? Um, I'll probably be able to get it for a search, right? Yeah. GitHub and actual project bring up. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> I say, yeah, I couldn't see what you're typing. That looks like it's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so so this should be fun because okay. Um, note to self: <laughs> make default important. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to get a issue that says that? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not going to put this one in because this is a self assessed one. So, okay, right, fine, 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 fine. Not important. Sorry, you have lots of you have lots of documentation. Yeah. So, if you put zero in false, does the check not run? Uh, good question. I'll come back to you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. So let's do the automated ones. Um, does it have a contribution file? Does it have a license file? Let's look at the committer trend. Let's see whether it's actively developed. Oh, God. <coughs> Since Robin isn't here, what's happened to citation files? They're still around? They're still, still around, yeah. yeah. But then someone's already tweeted that they recommended the ad. Good. Put it in as an issue. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's see if this works. I mean, it <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is so. There's a very amusing thing, and one of the reasons why I, I, I kind of like went, hmm. Um, so we've been running this on some popular repositories, and we've been coming up with some really interesting things. So, with the limited set of metrics we have here, it turns out there are some some things that do unexpected uh, results. So, the biggest one was we ran it on SciPy. Um, <laughs> And so, SciPy, uh, how many commits do you have, Vince? On this? Yeah. That many. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so for SciPy, uh, we, um, we ran this and see what you get. Silver award. Nice. Nice. That's good, because actually we haven't coded anything for the gold. Oh. So. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we ran this on SciPy, and we thought SciPy will hit all of these boxes. The number of committers um, for SciPy is diminishing. <laughs> so so uh, under the way that we had configured this, uh, we ran this at a demo, and um, SciPy got a bronze award, and we were like, damn it. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, but yeah, so, so this is, this is kind of like a really quick introduction to what we're trying to do here. I think... Um, and like the last thing I'd like to, to sort of say, because I realize we're now um, behind time, is... Go away, go away. There we go. Um, so, yeah. What we'd like to get from people is, what are the things you'd like to measure in something like the software assessment framework? Uh, so, um, if you have ideas for metrics, pop them in as issues. Um, if you're here on Wednesday, let's try and implement some of these. They should be fun. Uh, if you have ideas for really kind of silly ones, feel free to put those in as well, uh, because we'd, we'd like to try and test some of the, the data model that we're using here. So what we'd like to do is, if you can think of a metric that can be automatically assessed um, 
using what you think you should be able to find in a GitHub repository, do put it in. The other thing we're interested in understanding is um, what sort of software should we use as benchmarks? So when we want to do a test of this, what are the software, pieces of software in your areas that you consider to be sustainable, valuable, or impactful? Um, because we'd like to know what it is you benchmark against. Likewise, if you have things that you can think of in your area which you consider as not sustainable, not valuable, and not impactful, we'd also like to hear about that. Um, and then the last thing is, I did say that everything's in GitHub, so um, that's where we put it. But actually, are there any other things that you'd like to be able to connect to? So one of the things we'd love to do in the hack day is do a, um, is do a handler for the Depsy uh, kind of uh, API. Um, so are there sorts of things that you'd like to do? I know someone else has mentioned um, to me uh, OpenHub's API as well. So what are the kind of uh, other uh, facilities that you would like to draw into this so that it's all kind of available as part of the calculation of the scores. So, um, thank you very much for listening to me. Do download this and run it on your own software and then complain at me when you realize that you all get bronze certificates. So, thank you very much. <laughs>